Did everyone say it? Today we're going to talk about God's cure for complaining spirit. It's called I Can't Complain. That's my message. I can't complain. So I want you to, everybody standing up now? So you got to turn around to a couple of people and tell them two things. I thank God for you and say, I can't complain. Go ahead. I can't complain. You may be seated. Mark Twain said, never complain about your problems. 80% of the people don't care. And the other 20% think you deserve them. <laughs> the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians, writing this letter as he sits in a Roman prison, chapter 2, verse 14 and 16, he says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be pure and blameless, children of God, in a crooked and depraved generation, which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. And then toward the end of the letter, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say it, rejoice. Now look at those two statements and put them side by side. Do everything without complaining. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Do everything. Go through everything in life. Experience everything. Endure everything. Put up with everything without complaining, without finding the negative, without finding the fault, and without arguing, without creating drama and tension and controversy. And why does he say this? So that you may be pure and blameless children of God. You see, we're all children of God when we're born again. But it's up to us to decide whether or not we're mature or immature children of God. Immature children of God complain and argue. But as we mature, as we become pure and blameless, we begin to rejoice in the Lord always. And he says, you are like stars in the universe. You live in a crooked and depraved generation, a commentary on sin that we're crooked. Life is crooked. It's not straight. It's not in line with God's Word or God's will. It's depraved. It lacks any sense of moral boundaries. It lives with no regard for the law of God. And yet he says, in that world of spiritual darkness, you shine like stars. Jesus talked about that when he said, you're the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And Paul says, when you can live life without complaining or arguing, that becomes a light shining in a darkened place. Our joy dispels the darkness of this age. Our worship is a light shining in the darkness of this age. Our praise is a light shining. As you hold out the word of life, he says, as you go through life as a Christian, you're holding out to people God's word of life, the word, the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is Messiah, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when you have faith in Him, He will give you life abundant and eternal. You're holding out that message to others. And as you go in the world, you want to radiate the joy of the Lord. So do everything without complaining or arguing. And even sitting in a prison, that's one place you could complain. And if you complain, nobody would blame you for it being in a prison and then being there unfairly. And yet, even in those circumstances, he could say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, rejoice. Now, I don't think it's possible to go through life without ever complaining, so I'm going to let everybody off the hook now. But I believe we can minimize it. I believe we can reduce it. I believe we can grow to a place spiritually that is not a constant attitude of our lives, that that begins to become minimized and the spirit of gratitude and joy and praise becomes the predominant attitude of our lives. So I don't think we can ever go through life without ever complaining, but we can take it down a notch. And we can become pure and blameless and grow in grace and knowledge and find that we are more people of praise and gratitude than we are of complaining. A priest went to work at a monastery for a year of service. He had to take a vow of silence. 
And he was allowed at the end of every month to say two words and only two words. And he completed the first month of service and he went to the head of the monastery and he said, hard bed. He did another month of ministry and he came back to the head of the monastery and he said, cold food. After his third month of service, he came back and said, I quit. And the head of the monastery said, good, you've done nothing but complain since you got here. How can we live life without complaining or arguing? How can we do everything, experience everything, endure everything without complaining or arguing? I'm going to give you three steps of action that we can take. The first thing that we can do is restrain it. We can restrain our complaining. This is what the psalmist prayed in Psalm 141 verse 3. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, and keep watch over the door of my lips. He was asking God to help him restrain his words. And that's the first thing we can do with complaining is to become aware of it and now begin to practice restraint. Paul said the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. It's going to be in your mind. Don't let it come out. If it's going to be in your heart. Don't let it come out. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful. That's what you have to ask. If I complain about this, is it going to help or hurt? That it may help, he says, only what is helpful, so that it may benefit those who listen. The word benefit there in the Greek language means it may minister the grace of God to those who listen. Is it going to benefit? Is it going to build up? Or is it going to tear down? If I complain about this, how is it going to change anything? Is it going to make anything better? Is it going to change the situation? Is it going to make my relationship better? Or is it actually going to make things worse? Even though I may vent it and get it out, what's going to happen as a result of it? And the first step is learning to restrain the complaining. Think it, but don't say it. Write the email but don't send it. Delete it. And then when it says, want to save the draft, say no. Don't keep it in there. Write the text and then delete it. There's nothing good that's going to come from it. Practice restraint. You know, if you look at the life of Israel in the Old Testament, that's an interesting story of how they came out of Egypt and then went into the promised land. And yet they got stuck in a desert for 40 years. God had a wonderful land of promise. And they ended up getting stuck in a desert really because of their attitudes. They had unbelief. They had disobedience. But another predominant problem of the Hebrews was their constant spirit of complaining. Their complaining kept them out of the promise and kept them in their problem. And it will do the same in your life. It'll do the same in my life. It'll keep you from the abundance God has and keep you in a wilderness. It'll make your relationships a wilderness. It'll make your marriage a wilderness. It'll make your relationships with your kids a wilderness. It'll make the atmosphere for your work a wilderness. Constant complaining. And yet that was a problem that they never caught. It's a descriptive part of the life of ancient Israel in the days of Moses. And it all started at the Red Sea, even though God performed miracles, got them out of slavery. As soon as they got to the brink of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army pursued them, the Bible says in Exodus 14, verse 11 and 12, they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord and they said it would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And then you come to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. The book of Numbers written by Moses is a journal on the experience of the Israelites in the desert for 40 years. And he writes the entire book around seven stories of their constant complaining. The structure of Numbers is organized around seven major stories of the grumbling and the complaining of the Israelites. 
They complained about the manna. They complained about no water. They complained about the desert. They complained about Moses' leadership. They complained about the discipline of the Lord. You name it, and they constantly complained about it. Every time they were anxious, instead of trusting God, instead of praying, the first thing they would do is lash out in anger, lash out in complaint instead of trusting the Lord. And part of the thing that kept them in the wilderness was their constant complaining instead of trusting God to meet their need. And even though God continually provided for them, met every need that they had, at every crisis of life, the first thing they would do is lash out and complain. And the first step that you and I can take to learning to do everything without complaining and without arguing is to restrain it. Think it, but don't say it. Feel it, but don't vent it. Write it, but don't send it. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 23, I've seen this a lot in people's lives. I've met a lot of people like this verse. Proverbs 19, 3, a man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. I've met so many people who are mad at God, and I'm thinking, you're the one messing your life up. A person's own folly ruins his or her life. And yet, instead of taking responsibility for it, they rage against the Lord. The Bible tells us in John chapter 6, verse 43, when Jesus was teaching about being the bread of life. Some people didn't even like what he was saying that day about putting faith in him. And he says to them, stop grumbling among yourselves. Turn to somebody and say, stop it. And that's about as simple as it is. He stops his message. They're grumbling about what he's teaching. And he says, stop grumbling among yourselves. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, about what happens to us when we live in sin. The whole culture, he talks about the, the, the downward spiral of culture when people are not focused on God. And he says in that commentary, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. So they became foolish in their understanding. And their hearts were darkened. And this was a problem even in the early church. You hear James write about it in James chapter 5, verse 9. He says, do not grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. That's thought-provoking. Do not grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. He's calling for accountability in what we say, in our complaints, and our murmuring, and our grumbling. And the apostle Peter says it too. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, he says, Ask for alpha hospitality among yourselves, and do not grumble. That when you provide for people, don't turn around on the backside and say, I can't believe I invited all these people. <laughs> Offer hospitality... But don't grumble about it. In the first step of learning to not live with a complaining spirit is to restrain it and to pray, Lord, set a guard over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. Well, since you didn't like that point very well, I'll move on to the second one. <laughs> The second thing you can do is reframe it. Reframe the complaint. You ever put a new frame on an old picture, how good it looks then? It's pretty amazing. You can put a whole new frame on a photograph or a, a painting. It takes on a whole new life. It takes on a whole new perspective if you reframe the same portrait. And you can take a complaint and reframe it. So what do I mean by that? You can say it in a different way. I learned this technique in my master's program in counseling at the University of Georgia. Studying in particular marriage and family therapy, I remember reading about the technique in counseling called reframing. This is when a, a client would say something very derogatory about him or herself 
And at that point, you would try to help them reframe that in a more positive light. And I've had this happen to me on num- numbers of occasions. I think it's really a brilliant thing to do. Like if a person says, I'm just so naive, I'm always making the wrong decisions. I would stop and say, well, you're not naive, you're very trusting. And that's a very notable quality. That's a wonderful quality you have. It's a lot better than being cynical all the time or negative. You're a person with a large measure of faith and hope. You're a very trusting person. I have reframed naive to trusting. I've reframed a negative into a positive character quality. Then I would say, what you need to think about are the boundaries of trust. What are the limitations? To have wisdom and discretion so you're not taken advantage of by other people. And you can take a complaint and reframe it. Now, first of all, you could make a suggestion instead of a complaint. You could suggest something that you like instead of complaining about what you don't like. I had this in a marriage counseling just, just the other day. I've had this on n- numerous occasions. So there, this couple comes to see me, and in the middle of the conversation, she finally starts venting about, you know, my husband never takes me out. And she starts telling me, you know, we never got on dates anymore. We never do anything together. And, you know, he's just getting hammered. And he's kind of feeling embarrassed. So I intervened, and I said, can you find a different way of saying that? She said, no. (laughs) I said, well, can you think of a a way that you might could say that in a way that might help him understand it in a different way? She said, what do you mean? I said, make a suggestion. Say something like, honey, I like it when we go out. And I said, now, men are dumb, so the more specifics you can give with the suggestion, the more you'll get out of it. Say, honey, I like it when we go out on Thursday nights. I like it when we go to OK Cafe. And I got her to do it. And she could feel the impact, and he could certainly feel the impact. It's a lot different when your wife says, Honey, I like it when we go out together to OK Cafe versus you never take me out. It's like a a couple. They were farmers out in the Midwest, and a tornado came through in the middle of the night, picked up their farmhouse, threw it about a mile, broke the house into shreds, put the bed down. They were safely still in their bed. The house is gone, and she bursts out laughing. He says, honey, what are you laughing about? That was terrifying. She says, I'm so thrilled. That's the first time we've been out in two years. <laughs> so you can reframe a complaint by making a suggestion instead of a complaint. You can also offer a compliment instead of a complaint. Instead of focusing on what you don't like, focus on what you like. And if you'll focus on what you like in your relationships, you'll get more out of You'll always get the behavior out of others that you encourage. You will never get the change by complaining. We know this in the way that human behavior works. You will never get the desired behavior you want in other people by complaining or criticizing it, but you can always get the behavior you want by encouraging the behavior that you like. Whatever behavior you encourage, you'll always get more of that in any relationship. So you can reframe a complaint because some complaints actually have some measure of truth in them, but when we share it in a complaint form, then it destroys everything. If we could take it and find a way to make a compliment, then we could accomplish something productive in our lives. I remember a few Christmases ago, we had a magnificent Christmas production, and I think our Christmas productions are the best in the world. They're just so inspiring, focusing on the Lord Jesus, and they also have a lot of fun in them. Well, in that particular production, we had a drum corps come in 
to do a version of Little Drummer Boy, and we had 40 or 50 drums on the platform. Now, that didn't bother me because my first passion in life was to be a drummer. When I was eight years old, I started building my drum set. That was my first vision for my life. And then I started playing trumpet. I always wanted to be a drummer. And so that didn't bother me. You know, I just wish they'd given me one. I love that drum corps. And when they bring 50 drums in a building, you can pretty much rest assured it's not going to be quiet. That many drums are going to make a lot of racket. And Barbie loved it. Barbie's a frustrator. She's always wanted to be a drummer. Even to this day, uh, Christmas would come around and say, Honey, you want a drum set for Christmas? <laughs> she says, No, but I saw a bracelet I really liked. <laughs> so we love the drum corps. And 5,000 other people liked it. But somebody didn't like it, and so I got a long letter. And in the letter, it was verbally abusive, complaining about the drums. And as I read through the letter, as I got through it, I wrote him a nice response. Thank you for your invaluable input. <laughs> I mean, what else are you going to say? But as I read this letter, I thought to myself, if I could have written what I wanted to write, I would have asked him, was there anything you did like? Did you like the nativity scene? Did you appreciate that beautiful solo of Silent Night? Did you enjoy the Christmas carols? Did you enjoy the Hallelujah Chorus? What a magnificent portrayal of Jesus, and yet it's so easy for the one thing we don't like to stand out to make us so mad that he eclipses everything else we do like. And I could have even handled the letter better had it said, I love Silent Night, I love the nativity, I love the carols, but leave the drums out. I'm still not going to leave the drums out because I like drums, <laughs> but I could have appreciated it. And it's a great way to reframe a complaint. Put it in the form of a comp to compliment the things that we do like. Now, I want to say, I'm not saying, I want you to hear this, don't use a compliment to set up a complaint. I know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> I can't stand when people do that. Now, I really love you. I love this about you. But, no, it's I love you, period. Let's end it right there. I got that. Right? Don't use a compliment to set me up for a criticism, for a complaint. I'm not saying to use remarks that you make that build people up as some kind of a platform to lead into what you really want to say. I'm saying leave off the complaint. Find the things you like. Keep encouraging those. Keep affirming those. And notice that those are the behaviors that will become more expressive and entrenched in your relationships. So you can refrain from saying the complaint, and you can reframe it in the form of a suggestion. Honey, I like it when of a complaint, and I really appreciate this about you. And you can also make a request instead of a complaint. Instead of complaining about what you don't have, just ask for what you want. Even James said in the fourth chapter, James, verse 3, you have not because you ask not. That's not only true in prayer, it's true in life. And sometimes if we would just ask somebody for what we want, we might get it or get some measure of it. Do everything. Go through everything without complaining or arguing. Restrain it. Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Reframe it. I like this. I appreciate this. I enjoy this. And the last thing to do is replace it. Replace the complaining with something else. And what will we replace it with? Well, what did Paul teach us in this letter? He says, do everything without complaining. And then what does he say? Rejoice in the Lord always. 
I will say it again. Let your life get so full of praise and gratitude that that becomes the predominant mark of your life instead of complaining. Cicero, the Roman poet, said, gratitude is not only the greatest of all virtues, it is the parent of all virtues. You know, when we have little children, the first virtue we try to teach them is to say thank you, right? Even when they're little babies, honey, say thank you. Say thank you. Turn to somebody and say, say thank you. Go ahead and tell them. We need to be reminded of that. We need the Holy Spirit to say that every now and again. Say thank you. Gratitude is not only the greatest of all virtues, it's the parent. When people learn to be grateful, it is the parent. It is the virtue that creates other great virtues in our lives. I'm glad we live in a country that's going to celebrate this week a national day of thanksgiving. And in its origins, it's not just vague thanksgiving. It was intentionally designed to be a day of thanksgiving to God. The first thanksgiving was celebrated in Newfoundland in 1578 in a service led by a preacher by the name of Robert Walfel. He served Holy Communion and led the community in giving thanks, giving to God for his blessings. At Plymouth Rock Colony in 1621, the pilgrims gathered the people together and had a worship service of thanksgiving to God for the new land that they had. President George Washington issued the first National Day of Thanksgiving Proclamation, November 26, 1798. And then about 50 years later, in 1858, a woman by the name of Sarah J. Hale wrote a letter to all the governors of the states of this country imploring them to set aside a day of thanksgiving to God in every state. And every state took her counsel except for two states. But she wasn't content with that. She sent a copy of George Washington's Thanksgiving Day Proclamation to Abraham Lincoln. And he was so moved by it that he was the first one to establish an annual national day of Thanksgiving. He did that the last Thursday of 1863 in the middle of a great civil war. He called the nation to pause and look to God and give thanks to God. Two great things happened in 1863, the Emancipation and Proclamation for the Slaves and the establishment of a national day of thanksgiving to God. And his decision was ratified by the Congress in 1941, and it has become still to this day, every November, a day that the nation is called to look up to the heavens and to give thanksgiving to God. The best thing to do with complaining is to replace it with gratitude. Start telling God what you like instead of what you don't like. Start telling your husband what you like about him instead of what you don't like about him. Start telling your wife what you like about her instead of what you don't like about her. Start telling your kids what you like about them instead of the things you don't like. Start telling your parents the things you like about them instead of the things you don't like. Start thinking about the things you like in your church, not the things you don't like. Start thanking God for the things you like about America, not the things you don't like. We need to replace our complaining with gratitude to God. Replace it with Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10. When Moses said, when you've eaten and are satisfied, give thanks to the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. The answer to criticism and complaining is 1 Chronicles 16, 31. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, our God reigns. The answer to complaining is to replace it with Psalm 34, 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The answer to complaining is what Habakkuk the prophet wrote and declared even in a time of economic recession. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, though the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall there be fruit in the vine, though the labor of the olive shall fail and the field shall yield no produce, though the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Even when we're persecuted, Jesus said we ought to give praise to God. In Matthew 5 and 12, 
Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Those early apostles, when they were physically beaten and imprisoned for preaching the gospel of Christ, the Bible says in Acts 5, 41, that Peter and John rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. The answer to our complaining is in Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice evermore. Anybody have anything to rejoice about this morning? Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Replace it with Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. Let the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The writer of Hebrews employs us in Hebrews 13 and 15. Let us offer unto our God continually the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that give thanks unto his name. And why should we do that? Because of what the apostle Peter says to us in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had no mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. Replace your complaining with Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your life with good things so that your strength is renewed like the eagles. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah. Let's offer him praise this morning. Bless the Lord.
you. At the heart of our thanksgiving as Christians is the coming of Jesus Christ, the greatest gift. Paul says of the Lord Jesus in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is the greatest gift that will ever be given to you. The one thing I think that makes the Christian message different from what you normally hear in religion is that salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins is a gift from God to be received, not a work to be achieved. The scripture says, by grace are you saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. If you've not received the gift of God, the gift of Jesus Christ as your Savior, then I would like to pray a prayer of faith with you today. The Bible says in both Old and New Testaments, the scripture appears, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads that if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I want to pray with you now. Pray after me. Lord Jesus, I do believe in you. I believe you are God's only Son. I believe you came to this earth to die on the cross for my sins, to take my judgment, and to rise again as a guarantee that I may have eternal life. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I cannot save myself. I need your help. By faith, I receive you this day as my Savior. I put my trust in you, and I confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord, I believe in this prayer today. You are working in me the miracle of eternal salvation. I declare this is the day of my salvation. I shall witness to others that I am a Christian and Jesus Christ is my Lord. If you prayed with me today, I want to I wanna hear from you this week. Email me. I'll also be down here at the altar, Pastor Todd will I'll have prayer counselors on either side of the platform. If you'd like to come and talk with someone about your spiritual decision, or you need someone to pray for you, we'll be here. In three weeks, the band and I, Mike Park and our band Open Door, and many people that volunteer going to the Central State Prison, so I'd appreciate today you picking up one of these boxes. And if you can't do that, just a gift of $25. We did this two years ago. I was there doing a concert. I, I cannot describe to you, and I was overwhelmed by the tears on the faces of these men coming to us, thanking us, and I thought, it's just a simple box. It's hard for you to understand and hard for me that something so simple can mean so much, and yet it means so much to those men for us to go, and we're going to do a Christmas concert and to sell, tell them this is from the Mount Perrin family. You, you just can't imagine what it does to those men. And there's a great revival in Central State Prison. We'll have a 1,000 men in that gym for that concert. It's amazing to see the Holy Spirit at work. So I'd appreciate you picking up a box or helping any way that you can with that project. God bless you. Have a great day and happy Thanksgiving. It has been great to share this time of worship with you. The psalmist says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Sunday is the day that we gather to worship the Lord as we begin our week together. It's amazing to me how refreshed we are spiritually and what strength we gain when we come together to worship the Lord. I ask for your prayers for me and the pastoral staff and the entire ministry of our church that we would continue to know and to do the will of God. I also appreciate the support that you give to the church as you're able to help the church with tithes and offerings. You're always able to give by clicking the blue Give button on the live web page and to support all the ministries of the church as the Lord leads you. Finally, it is incumbent upon all of us 
to become evangelists. Now, I know sometimes that may feel intimidating for all of us. We might not even feel qualified to share our faith, but we are. We're all living witnesses of Jesus Christ. Take this worship service, the music, the prayers, the Word of God that is shared, and share them with your friends and those who need the Lord. Again, thank you for being a part of this great worship service today, and I pray God's richest blessings on you as you begin a new week.